We are going to have a great afternoon. We've got a bunch of companies uh, from the launch pad uh, who are going to present in the session after this one. And as you know, yesterday some of the most exciting companies came from uh, that group. Uh, another amazing uh, panel of judges, Dave Morin, um, awesome product developer, a big fan of your latest product, Path. Uh, turned down $100 million from Google. Obviously, absolutely insane. You can't comment on that. Uh, but you make a beautiful product, and I think that you're going to add a zero to that exit uh, if it ever happens, or when it happens. Uh, Chris Saka, angel investor, uh, extraordinaire, uh, Twitter. And how many companies have you invested in since you started your fund? Uh, probably 65. 65 companies. Uh, Ted Mandenberg from US Venture Partners. Um, investors in a lot of different companies, but you may know one of them, Living Social, which is doing extraordinary raised, I think $75 million from Amazon or something, $750 million, $7.5 billion, what was it? $183. $183 billion from Amazon. Uh, no, $183 million from Amazon and then gave away 20 Amazon dollars for $10, an amazing business model, sell $20 bills for $10. Um, and it seems to be working. Uh, Andrea Zurich is... Uh, We'll hear about it later. I'm trying to figure out that math. Uh, Andrew Zurich is a, a Googler who now runs uh, a venture firm, angel fund, backed by Googlers. Is that correct. correct? Yeah, all private financing. All private financing. And you've been doing this for over a year? Uh, I'm sorry. Oops, thank you. Yeah, right into the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> doing it for three years. We've done oh. about 30 investments and five exits. Wow, congratulations on the five hours. Uh, David Young uh, from Joyent, uh, one of the great technology and hosting providers, um, working with a large number of companies. I don't know who the biggest. Uh, yeah, Guilt Group, LinkedIn, eBay. Um, I've heard of a couple of them. A lot of Facebook um, <laughs> applications. Uh, and how many servers in your cloud and how many data centers is it now? It's huge. Um, yeah, we're, we're over 15,000 servers. We're operating in mainland China, the only cloud that's available in mainland China, Europe, North America. We're breaking into South America. We also offer our software to other service providers, so you don't have to get it from Joint. You can get it from KDDI, other, other service providers like that. Awesome. Aaron, uh, former AOLer, I believe? No, your partner is from AOL. But uh, one of the co-founders and CTO of Living Social, which has just been an extraordinary hit. Um, Give us some impressive, insane statistic. How many of those Amazon $20 bills did you sell for $10? Over a million in a day. So you lost $10 million selling those, but I'm assuming that the, the uh, emails that you acquired must have been huge. How many members did, new members did you get that day? Lots. Okay, well, there you have it. Uh, it was a good day. It's a good day for the It was an awesome day, and uh, you guys are crushing it. I don't know, how many cities are you in now? I mean, I guess that's the statistic. Uh, almost, a little over 200 markets. 200 markets already. Uh, I heard 1,200 employees from 200 last year. Is that Correct. the number? Um, so you add... About six or seven a day. Adding, how do you add six or seven people a day? I, it's not easy, but it's, it's part of growing. It's part wow. of how we scale. That is part... That, I would say that's the understatement of the year. It is part of growing. Uh, Jeff Thomas, uh, VP at Second Market. Um, what do you do there? I don't, um, we haven't met yet, but I know Barry, and Barry couldn't make it. So uh, tell us something interesting about second market at this point. I know that Facebook is selling about a billion shares a week on second market. Is that the correct number? <laughs> I wish. Uh, yeah, I head up business development here on the West ah. Coast for the private company market. Uh, so we work with uh, private venture-backed companies to create liquidity for their shareholders. So we've created over $500 million in liquidity uh, across about 50 venture-backed startups. Wow. Half billion dollars in liquidity mm -hmm. from how many startups? Uh, over 50. 50 and 500, I think that's about 10 million a startup, but I'm assuming there might be one or two big ones in there yep. that have done well. If I, if I bought Facebook shares or LinkedIn shares or Facebook and LinkedIn and Groupon shares like three years ago when you guys first started trading them, how much would I be up right now? Uh, I think some folks have gotten a 10x on it. So Yeah. I think uh, at least, um, so an, another amazing uh, group of judges. Let's bring out our first company, Audio uh, Micro, which is in the 2.0 competition, which is an existing company launching a new product. Welcome, Audio Micro. All right. <laughs> hello, hello. For the next five minutes, no iPads, no Blackberries. Focus on the demo. I promise you won't be disappointed. We're Audio Micro. We've built the world's largest collection of stock music and sound effects with over 225,000 tracks in any genre. 
We empower independent artists to upload their content and we license it out on behalf of them to customers like iJustine and Discovery Channel and anyone in between. So you understand what they're if you take a look at our back end, we'll show you that we're up to about 179,000 users today. And we're really proud of that and proud of what we've built. And because of our success in the audio space, we've decided to take this content management licensing platform and clone it and deploy it into new content verticals. So we took a go big or go home approach today. We're, we're not launching one new product, we're gonna do four in the next five minutes. The first new site is Choose Tattoos. It's a marketplace for licensing tattoos. The world's best tattoo artists upload their artwork and people can preview it, search and browse before they go get inked. There's over a billion people on the planet with a tattoo, many of which have multiple tattoos. You can hover over any of our pieces of art and get a nice pop-up preview. Everything's watermarked to prevent piracy. If you're a buyer or a seller of tattoos, you can check out your dashboard. At that point, you can see how many credits you have. Now, we sell credits just like Facebook credits. You use those credits to download tattoos. You can also see your purchase history, and you can see your earnings if you're an artist. And we pay your royalties to you every month directly via PayPal, and we pay you 40% of what we receive. If you're an artist, you're gonna to wanna to upload. From your upload page, you can grab any number of files from your local machine and upload them after agreeing to our terms of service. Once you upload, everything goes into an editor's queue where it's reviewed by a person that's tattooed from head to toe. They check out your tattoos. If they're quality, they make their way into the library. If they're not good, they're rejected. We give you a reason why. All tattoos, important to note, come with a line stencil. That's something that your tattoo artist is going to use to outline the tattoo on your body before you get it permanently put on yourself. While we're in the back end, I wanna highlight a couple cool features. Our landing page creator. Now, tattoos are Googled as, almost as much as porn. It's a massive space. And we can deploy landing pages around all of the long tail queries related to tattoos in a number of seconds. We simply type in a, a, a slug, we add the meta, we type an original article, we import particular tattoos for that category, and we publish. We then use our super secret link building techniques to build links to that page, at which point traffic starts to flow in and we monetize that traffic. Another thing to highlight here in the back end is our report manager, where you can export any number of reports, including your royalties, as well as your sales reports. Now, in the next minute, we're gonna launch three more sites. So you saw Choose Tattoos, well here comes three more. Cartoonsy is a marketplace for licensing cartoons, where publications like the New York Times, Read Write Web, VentureBeat, or Mahalo can get cartoons to use in an editorial manner. We've aggregated artwork from the world's greatest cartoonists. Our next site is Celebrity Pictures. We've got everything from Katy Perry to Justin Bieber, all at imagecollect.com. Now, I come from this space. My previous company was bought by Getty Images for $200 million and it was a celebrity photo library. We're launching Image Collect today with over 750,000 images from the last 10 years. If you've got need celebrity pictures, your search ends here. Our final site, which we're really jazzed about, is Infographic Stock. That's a marketplace for buying and selling infographics based upon the same content management system that we've shown you with the previous sites. Now, as we come down the home stretch, I just wanna tell you a few cool things. Your login is good across all of our sites. So are your credits. So if you're a buyer of infographics, you can also get cartoons and any other piece of content you like. Now up on this slide, you'll see 25 ideas off the top of our head. These are different types of content marketplaces that we can go into. Because our content management system that we've developed is white labelable, which means that basically think of it like WordPress for content licensing. We can deploy these marketplaces in minutes. Not only can we do them for ourselves, but we can do them for you too. So if you've got content and you wanna monetize it, contact us and we can work out a partnership deal. Open up your mind and think about the possibilities. Thanks so much. Okay, judges, um, what are your thoughts on this 2.0 company? Well, I'm really bummed they didn't make you get inked as part of the demo. Uh, oh, I, think I was it supposed been to awesome. tell you that. That's the only, yeah, that was the only deficiency of your demos. You should have had a chair here with a big burly guy making him bleed. See, I was going to show you my tattoos, but they're not stage appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> the location is not stage appropriate. The tattoo itself is okay. That's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> Thoughts?
So I'm a, I'm a big fan of marketplace business models, but I think the one thing we always look for um, before we enter a new market is just, you know, the illiquidity in that market. So I don't know, is there, is there a lot of pent up demand for tattoos where people want to find that tattoo and want to pay for it and they can't? <coughs> there is, there's a massive demand. One in four people on earth has a tattoo, uh, a billion, over a billion people. And tattoos, as I tried to mention, is Googled almost as much as adult content. So the organic traffic around looking for tattoos is absolutely insane. And all those people are actually looking for imagery, which they ultimately want, and for as little as $10, they can actually download that at Choose Tattoos. So we're super jazzed about the size of that market, and it's a real disparate, fragmented market. There's like 300 tattoo parlors in San Francisco, like on, in the peninsula alone, and it's, it's just, we're, we're taking that artwork and really opening it up to a whole new world. Like imagine if you're in London and you want a guy in San Fran's art, you can now download it locally and go to your local London parlor and get it tattooed on yourself. Is the opportunity tattoos and cartoons, or is it, as you say, licensing the um, content licensing platform? Um, we'll find out. Uh, I, I personally... You're, you're yeah. a 2.0 company, so is this a pivot for you? Sure, if you want to use that word, uh, you, could, you, you could, you know, Audio Micro started as a stock music library, so now that we're in the tattoo space and the cartoon space, it's pretty obvious that that's sort of a, a pivot of a sort, right? When I envisioned the company, it wasn't that. Um, and I think that to answer your question about what's bigger, um, I think that some of these markets like tattoos and celebrity photos, I have immediate money that's coming in the door, right? I know that the space is really, really large and I know that I can monetize it. Um, for infographics, it's a little bit experimental. It'll probably need to morph into more like a 99 designs where you can have a you know, custom graphic done for you on spec. Um, but our CMS is very flexible and we can deploy those customizations if necessary. I think it'll be really interesting to find out, but the bottom line is, as you sort of pointed out in your question alone, like, with, if I do 25 of these, get them to a million in rev each, two million in rev each. I mean, we're a serious business at that point. Imagine if we do 40 of them, then they grow to four or five mil a piece. So. How do you guys do rights, rights clearance? Yeah. So with celebrity images, it's not very difficult because I know the content owners and photography is owned by typically the person that takes the picture. Um, with tattoos, we have everybody enter into an upload agreement and there's a lot of reps and warranties in there that, that say that they own the work or that they have contractual rights to distribute it. It's actually not as big as a problem as you think, but we do review everything for copyright infringement. That's why an editor is looking at those and they're looking for those things. Which one of these communities is the fastest growing? Um, well, they're just now live like as of a minute ago. Oh, really? But let's see who has the most Facebook likes. I think we have like I don't know, where's Noah? But I think we have about 500 on Choose Tattoos already. Yeah, it seems like the tattoo market is huge and fairly liquid. And why wouldn't you focus there? Um, I think that we could bite off more than just that. I mean, I've done, I've done one before, right? So I know what it takes. And I think we can take on four more right now. Okay. So I like your vertical approach. I think it's interesting that you did choose the tattoo market because I do, I do agree with you that there is a huge potential there. But how do you decide after you've, if, after you've chosen all these different verticals, which ones are going to stick and which ones are probably going to go by the wayside? <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I'm, I've, I've failed companies before. So I know to bury them when they're not working out so well. So. The good news is, is that you won't see me chasing after something that's not worth it. So we'll pretty quickly find out which of these are going to be the, you know, be the leaders and we'll follow the, those. And you know, just for instance, I buried a voicemail sharing platform that I launched uh, six months ago and just moved on and we'll do the same with these if necessary. But there's so little cost to launching a new one that you could launch 150 of these. Yeah. Two of them will succeed, they'll make up 85% of their revenue and the rest cost nothing to just live out in the ether. Aaron, you're so right. I mean, the, the cost of doing this is, is almost nothing other than recruiting artists, which is not difficult. I do that pretty on, on much on the cheap. And, um, you know, we throw things against the wall and some stick. You know, that's the way, that's the way it works, right? Do you pay less when you get a tattoo if you bring in your own art? <laughs> um, yeah, do you want yes, the tattoo, Ted? <laughs> yeah. You do, you do, and I'll tell you why. Because, you know, a lot of people will get custom tattoos and there's an iteration process there. You have to have an artist draw it for you and go back and forth. And if you bring them an actual image that you know you've decided on, maybe with a few tweaks, you're going to save yourself a lot of time. And obviously, it's permanent, so you're going to save yourself some potential trouble. T tell me a little bit more about, um, so you're like the demand media of, of tattoos now, like you're a tattoo content farm, <laughs> which is a phrase that even if you've had like a random business plan generator, I'm not sure con tattoo content farm would ever come up, but <laughs> I, 
it seems maybe like an awesome idea. Tell me a little bit more about that. About being a demand media? Uh, no, yeah, about like, so yeah. your content generator, I mean, your content and linking secret yeah. sauce. Yeah. You took the words right out of my mouth. I've actually put on my business card, like, demand media for content, you know, and, and so. It, Wait, that's pretty funny. I think yeah. Rosenblatt would laugh at that. The demand media for content, is, isn't that what he's trying to be? Well, for, <laughs> for, for uh, content. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I left a word out, content licensing. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, that was what I meant. So, like, I, I love those taglines. Like, Audio Micro was originally iStock photo for music. So now Audio Micro's turned into, like, demand media for content licensing, poking fun at going after targeted verticals. Um, without a doubt, that's what we want to do. But again, I think, Aaron, I mean, Aaron's really on it in that we go after the leaders. I mean, some of these spaces are going to be bigger than others. And we're just going to bury the stuff that's small, you know? But, but what I'm asking is, are you going to have, like, tattoo editorial? I mean, or is it going to be oh. everyone who's already expressed purchase intent around tattoo, you're SEOing for that? Or are you literally, are these going to be editorial pages with kind of half-assed content about tattoos and the process? The landing, and stuff? yeah, landing pages have, uh, if you want to, so butterfly tattoos, tribal tattoos, uh, uh, Heart tattoos are Googled quite a lot, so there's, there's gonna, we're going to tell you about heart tattoos and we're going to show you a nice selection of it, but you know, we can make a magazine for tattoos out of this. We can make a Flipboard style RSS feed for really cool tattoos which people love to eat. We can also, or consume, sorry. Yeah. We, we could also do the same sort of thing for uh, celebrity images. So yeah, there's a lot of kind of other verticals around the space, okay. but I, I, I like to license and sell the content. I mean, so. just for shits and giggles, I'm not saying this is the best business angle, but yeah. I would love to see the OkCupid okay blog for your tattoo content. I, I got think it. there's probably some train wreck tattoos out there that would be really, really <laughs> fun to see more data around. Totally, our blog will be, needs to have some creative like angles and that's right perfect on. for it. Awesome, let's hear it for Audio Micro. Right. Okay, next up is Graphite. Graphite, please come to the stage. Graphite. Yes. Bring these things, like are we? You don't have to score. We're, just, we're having a discussion and then. Yeah, just give them their best feedback, best one-liners. Um, <coughs> presentation style, um, business okay. model, any of those questions or you know, product okay. design, awesome. entrepreneurship, startup, blah, blah, blah. But don't worry about scoring. Graphite, are you ready? Hey, thanks very much, Jason. We're really excited to be here at launch to unveil Graphite. Graphite's a professional networking tool that's designed to allow you to systematically move people from contacts to relationships with maximum efficiency. Let's show you how it works. First of all, Graphite learns who's in your network. It syncs multiple address books and social networks, giving you an aggregated and continuously updated view of who you know. Second of all, Graphite learns where you're networking, day in and day out, without you having to tell it everything you do. It monitors multiple inboxes, calendars, phone calls on smartphones, and social networking interactions. Graphite tracks who you're interacting with, in what medium, for how long, and how frequently. In addition, Graphite lets you teach it the relative effectiveness of different activities. Because we all know some meetings are killer and some just suck. Right? Now that Graphite, the third thing Graphite does is it keeps track of why you're networking, your business goals. Graphite lets you, individually or collectively, rank the relative importance of different people in your professional network. And because different people have different goals for you, you can set relationship targets for people. Some folks, you're perfectly fine having them to be just a basic contact. Other folks, you want to be actively promoting you, cheerleading for you. Now that Graphite knows who's in your network, where you're networking, and why you're networking, it can go to work for you. By knowing your personal goals and having access to all these data sources, Graphite sort of becomes the eHarmony meets Mint.com for professional networking. Graphite crunches all that data and creates for you a personalized call sheet, an evergreen prioritized set of recommendations of the people with whom you ought to be networking. Now, the first way that call sheet makes your life a lot better is due to its comprehensiveness. Because Graphite is monitoring all your networks, and all your networking, you don't ever have to worry that someone who's important to you is going to fall through the cracks. For instance, you can see here at the top of my call sheet, Graphite's recommending that I get in touch with Ted Mizell. That's actually a pretty good recommendation for me because he's an important guy in my network. 
He's a former boss of mine, and he's a big wig in the tech scene in Southern California. And I haven't been in touch with Ted all that much lately. I am actually pretty happy with that recommendation. Even more so, I like the fact that Graphite gives me a visual view of the history of my relationship with Ted over time in a graph. It tracks the ebb and flow of that relationship, so I can see when the relationship was at its peak, and I can see how the relationship has gra gradually eroded over time because we haven't been in touch that much. Now, a call sheet that does a better job than my memory of knowing who I ought to be interacting with and who's important to me is already going to make me more effective, but the reality is Graphite goes further. And that's because many times a specific context of where you're working actually really should drive who you want to be interacting with. Graphite's call sheet be can be contextually filtered to show you in priority order the people who are most important to you relevant to that context. Say I'm going to be in New York next week for meetings. We can filter my call sheet by New York and it will show me in priority order the people in New York that I ought to be spending time with. Now, there's one other way that Graphite helps you out. And that's, uh, imagine, I'm sure this has never happened with any of you, but imagine you're at an airport and maybe your flight got delayed by an hour and a half or so. You probably have the option of pulling out that morning's USA Today that someone shoved under your hotel room door. Or you could grab your, your smartphone, call up Graphite and see your call sheet and start to turn that delay time into networking time. Here, my call sheet says I ought to be calling Jason. So I'll just hop on the phone and say, hey, Jason, it's John Slade. Thank you very much for inviting Graphite to come present at launch. It was great to be here. We got a ton of great feedback, saw a lot of great companies. Once we're all settled back in down in LA, we'd love to have lunch with you one of these times because we really want to pick your brain on a subject we think you're expert on, how to get Graphite a lot of great publicity on TechCrunch. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's Graphite. So Graphite keeps track of who you know, where you're networking and why you're networking with them. And it does that to make you incredibly more effective at turning people from contacts into relationships. Thanks very much. Okay, panelists. So, so I, have a, I have a question. Right into the microphone, guys. So oh, okay, sorry. I have a question. So I've done sales for about 15, 16 some odd years and I've used a gazillion different contact management databases. And I found that they're only as good as the variables that you put in to measure the information that you want to get out of it. So how customizable really is your system? And what would encourage me from switching to something that I already use, like Salesforce, for example? Um, how are you going to make that switch? So, so there's two things there. First of all, we're actually not encouraging you to switch from Salesforce. We think Salesforce is fantastic at managing things that are in the funnel, right? When you've got a, an opportunity identified and you're filling out a proposal and you're running it through to getting the, the business. Salesforce is great at that. Siebel's great at that. We're not trying to compete with that. We're working stuff above the funnel. The building up relationships so you get to the point that you actually have a chance to, to participate in the deal. So that's first answer. Second one, you don't need to do that. We'll sit on top of these systems and we'll pull your contacts from any, of, any or all of those systems and keep an aggregated view of them. And our filters allow you, to allow you to just search on any of the meta tags that are in there, however you structure your data. So you don't have to worry about you know, putting data in this field or that field. We'll aggregate people according to whatever data format you have. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it okay. helps. Cool, thanks. Are you guys trying to solve the, uh, the issue of who knows who in your network? Not yet. Today, we're not solving the problem of a connection of mine and a connection of yours. We might do that someday. We want to get out and get user feedback on whether they really think they need that. What we're really about is trying to help users maximize their own networks that they have today. Discovery might come further down the road, but not today. Yeah, I, I, I see a big problem here, which is, um, you know, I have a Windows phone here, and I'm not plugging it, but they have an option to sort of plug into Facebook. Second I plug into Facebook, I have a thousand people in my contacts that I don't want to have in my contacts. So a lot of these networks have a lot of, of, of noise. I'm really broadcasting out to them. I'm, I'm, I don't really want to have signals coming back per se. So I would see that as being one, one problem with you know, the mix of different data sources. The other thing is, is I live in a cave. I don't want to be told when to speak to people. This, this seems very dystopian to me, where I'm constantly being tapped on the shoulder by a system to reach out to someone. It's just sort of a first blush. Um, but Why don't I respond to that? 
I mean, clearly this is a relationship management system. And in our research, we talked to hundreds of people who are in, you know, uh, enterprise selling, um, wealth management, commercial real estate, and their job, the, the cash register rings when they do a good job of relationship management. Uh, it's not somebody who's kind of fending off relationships. We found about somewhere between eight and 10 million people whose real um, effectiveness is driven by this pre-funnel activity, and they have no transparency at all. Um, so, you know, if we can solve that problem, we believe those eight to 10 million people will be wildly more effective. And, and surprising, they're, they're spending between one and two days a week working on those non-transactional relationship building activities and have no way to see how effective they're being. But to come back to what Andrew's saying, I, I constantly work with my sales team to focus on one or two relationships and get those working well rather than how do I manage 300 relationships. I just don't see that as being a plausible scenario. So that, let, me, let me just put some data out there. I see we talked about 200 people in our target markets. They're typically managing between 2,500 and 5,000 business contacts. And once again, they have no system for doing that. Um, and some portion of those are active in deals, maybe 5 or 10%, but they know if they're not prospecting the, that big database next quarter, two quarters from now, those opportunities won't be in their pipeline. Yeah, I, the final comment, I, you know, on the positive side, I, I'm always surprised how systems like this do bring out that sort of 5 to 10% of information, the connections, as you say, that you didn't know about. So I, I guess I'd have to use it to really... I mean, one test I'd ask you to do, I don't know if this ever happens to you, I'm looking through my um, address book to do, you know, find somebody and inevitably I stumble across somebody and say, darn it, that's a great person I knew, I've not reached out to that person and I kind of regret because that person has now gone dormant, right? I mean, that happens to me, maybe you're better than I am in terms of maintaining those relationships, but that happens to me probably <coughs> once a month. I started kicking myself and I said, we need to have a system that can do this systematically for large numbers of contacts. Fair comment. The other thing, just from a sales perspective, the other thing that might be useful is a lot of times I, even nowadays, I still have duplicate records. You know, I keep my contacts in a lot of different places, either, you know, Google Docs spreadsheets, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook. A lot of times my Facebook friends aren't necessarily my LinkedIn friends and vice versa. Plus, for example, putting in my old school <laughs> sales hat, I might have a lot of contacts in Salesforce. So I guess my core like, question is, are you going to allow developers or something like that to have like an open API where you can somehow either integrate all these different systems and or at the same time dedupe them? Or I guess what's the ultimate usefulness for this? <laughs> well, I think the ultimate usefulness really yeah. is helping me focus my time. Yep. But about, you know, in order to do that, we're going to need to have some really kill, killer deduping capabilities, right? We don't necessarily want to become the system of record that writes data everywhere, but we want to aggregate data everywhere so that we know that the Bob that's over here is the same Robert that's over here and is the same Robbie that's over here. And we want to make it easy for you to do that intuitively so that you can know that when the, the, the algorithm recommends reaching out to Bob, it's also Robert, who's also Robbie. Great. Let's take a final question here. Shervin, you have a question? Okay. Can I? Well, yeah, good. First, I see the utility for it 100%. Even as a non salesperson, I kind of forget to stay in touch with some people sometimes. I come down, I live up in the mountains, I come down to San Francisco, I forget who I want to hang out with until I'm here. I fly into New York, I forget who my homies are in New York. I, I, I get that utility. One of the things I really like about it is there is no forced symmetry or mutuality in this app. Like, you know, LinkedIn comes down to the, have, the haves and the have nots. You know, you're either connected or you're not, and it creates this false imbalance. That, that really makes it uncomfortable for some people. And the same thing has happened with Facebook a little bit where you have to come up with your own standard for who's your Facebook friend and who's not. So I like that stuff. Um, I'm actually surprised, like, you've brought up eHarmony. Like, I, I feel like it could be a good app for chasing ladies. Like, I feel like it could actually be a good app for singles. Like, and I feel like a lot of your target demographic for that app would be in this room right now. Um, so I'm, I'm, curi like, I'm curious where you think this extends that we've talked about the sales demographic, but like in terms of personal relationships, whether your friends or potential dating and stuff like that, like what's your perspective on that utility? So, so one thing, um, a couple things. The reason we say eHarmony, um, we do have a bunch of science behind this system. Um, the chief scientist out of eHarmony is actually helping us do relationship scoring. It's also a micro event system. So we have the head of machine learning at Caltech who's co uh, coached the ensemble team that won the Netflix prize for um, performance on micro scoring. So there is a science behind that. I think what I would say is what we've learned from them is the relationships on a social level are a little bit more um, random and circuitous. When it's business and purpose driven, it's a lot easier to predict utility. 
right? And I think longer term, we can create larger circles that go into the more nebulous areas of chemistry. Uh, this is a utility-driven function, and frankly, we think that that will drive the ability of people to pay, um, you know, in terms of a business model in short term. Dave, you study uh, social networks, having worked at Facebook and Path. What are your thoughts? I can't hear you. Oh, I was saying you study uh, yeah. the, the social network, whether it's at Facebook or your new company, Path. What do you think? So one of my questions that I had was, uh, you said a couple of times that uh, you're focusing on helping people focus their time. And it seems as though the algorithm is more focused on telling you who you're not spending time with, um, sort of on the margins. And so I'm wondering sort of a little bit more about how the algorithm works. Um, one of the things we know from building path is that um, people, you know, have a very, you know, the brain can only handle so many uh, connections at one point in time, which is why you forget people, right? right? And the, the focus, number yeah, problem. well, yeah, the, focusing on people who uh, are the highest value to you, whether it's personal or, or professional, is very important. So I'm wondering if, do those people matter that are on the outer edge, or should you be focusing more time? I think somebody else asked this too. Should you be focusing more time on the inner, inner circle and stuff? So remember how we talked about how we monitor where you're networking day in and day out? Yeah. That's so that we can keep track of the fact that you've had 10 emails with, with Jane in the last month. If you've had 10 emails with Jane in the last month, and she could be the most important to you, chances are you probably don't need to be sending her an email right then. Yeah. So by monitoring what you're actually doing day in and day out in your <coughs> calendars, your phone logs, in your inboxes, that actually informs the algorithm and it comes up with a recommended set of who you're, who you're spending time with. So if you're spending a lot of time with someone already through, the, through your calendar, your inbox, your phone calls, or even social networking interactions, you're not gonna show up high in that algorithm because the system is, is believing that you're already making progress on building that. What if, the, what if the value of that time is much higher than, you know, than, than with somebody else? Sure, the value, of the, yeah. the value of time is different between people. So that's where we allow you to look at the events. You're not gonna look at all your emails, yeah. right? But if you had five meetings in the last three days that were useful, we're gonna allow you to look at that and score the ones that were really great and say those were really great meetings and score the ones that were really crappy and say they were really crappy and that will affect the amount of relationship building strength that the, that they, that the algorithm scores accordingly and then affects the recommendations. I think the other subtlety is in business purposes we're focusing on utility which is different than social relationships where I spend time with who I like. Yeah. Not to suggest we shouldn't spend time with people you know, if I don't like you sure. I'm not going to do business okay. with you let's but it's kind of a bias. Sure. And let's thank Graphite. Thank, thank you. you. Next up is Junar. Junar to the stage. English. Junar to the stage. Junar, all the way from Chile and Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Junar, come on out. Please welcome Junar to the stage. Hi. Search engines are pretty good if you're looking for content, articles, news, but they're not that good if you're looking for data. Have you ever tried to look for data for facts in the web? I have a good friend, he's a journalist uh, covering the mobile industry. If he goes to Google and does a search to get some facts on the mobile industry, he gets a couple problems. Number one, he gets a lot of links and those links may take him to very good content but not the facts he needs. The second problem is that even if he's able to get to the facts, the best he can do is copy-paste that into his document. Third, data never sleeps. So he will need to go day after day and get the data and put it into his document to keep it updated. There has to be a better way. Let us show you how Junior makes it easy for him to find the data he needs, track the data, and use it as he wants. So here's the solution. He now goes to Junior. He does the same search. And what he gets is a lot of links, results. And these results take him to data directly. These are what we call data streams. And these data streams are tables, are pieces of tables hanging in the web that some people have created, right? Here we can see who created that. We can also check the source. So if this journalist likes what he's seeing, he can add this to his dashboard. Now, Here's his dashboard. This is the place where he keeps track of all the data that is going to help him writing this article. He can also check if someone in this junior community has created any data that he may be able to use. So he goes there, he searches, and he finds out 
that Om has created a, a public dashboard where he shares some information about mobile industry. He adds that to his dashboards. And now it's like if he was following the data that Om is publishing. In his everyday, he goes to a lot of different sites to gather a lot of data, right? He can go to one of these sites, and by selecting the cell, the column, the row, or the full table, if that is what he wants, he can create a new data stream. Now, he gives a name, a description, and some tags, and voila, here we have a new data stream that anybody in this community can now use. So we have helped him bring a lot of data in, but we also allow him to get a lot of this data out. How? He can send that today to export to Excel. He can even embed one of these data streams into his documents, such that whenever the data changes in the source, it's going to change in the document that he's working on. The other thing that he can do is share this via Facebook, via, via Twitter. And finally, he can embed this into his blog or into his site Google or his net vibes. So yes, we have been able to help this journalist by gathering a lot of data from different places in the web. We also help him to share this data as he wants, right? Uh, And there's another thing here. This has been very useful for a journalist, but it can also be very useful for anybody that is looking for any data. Say, for example, Egypt. You want to get some facts about what happened in Egypt last week. Or you want to know some information about what the launch team uh, created about uh, the accelerator's proposal. So there's a lot of things, uh, there are a lot of times when you need data and you can go and find it very easily. If Google and RSS and wikis have changed the way in which we discover content in the web, Junior will change forever how we discover data. Thank you. I think it's really, really cool. It's sort of a crowdsourced Bloomberg for everything, for everything and not just financial. Uh, a lot of companies who make a lot of money off of this are, uh, when you do the crowdsourcing, you're not necessarily, you know, clearing the rights for commercial use. Is this all going to be free or will you charge for part of the uh, service? Great question. So we're starting with a freemium model. So a lot of what you've seen is for free. Everything what you've seen is for free. But for some premium services, you're going to need to pay twelve ninety-five a month. I love the idea. Um, I would just say that from a technical standpoint, I have lots of doubts. I mean, I don't know if you've heard of a, of a platform called OpenDoc, which was pushed by Apple and IBM way back when. Same exact <coughs> vision. Didn't work. It's just sort of the messiness of humans and data and how they interact. Um, I wish it worked this way. Best of luck to you. But uh, I, I see the, the standards as being the hardest part of this. Yeah, no, and it's, we have, uh, a couple of good gurus, but I agree with you. That's a very, uh, very tough point uh, we need to work on. So the, the data sources are essentially static in a lot of places online. So you're depending on them to updating. But in most cases, this data is just reblogged or in some other new report. So there's no way to associate and then re-update any given piece of data. So that, I think that's a, a challenge. So most of our technology does exactly that. We're able to connect. It's like. We're creating a database out of all the websites or the tables that exist in websites. And that's where we were really good at detecting when there are changes and being able to bring those changes. We don't store the data of all these places where these uh, creators have created a kind of an, a data RSS. But we are connected to them, and we can know when there's a change, and then we can bring it back. So I agree. Not all of those are going to be dynamic, but a lot of those are. Can you talk about the premium features that you want people to pay for? Like, what would those be? Yeah, so a lot of things, in, in a lot of the cases, people is going to go there and either create new data streams or consume what already exists. Actually, most of the times, we're going to consume what already exists. There are some cases where you will need to create some new data streams. And in those cases, you might want to ask somebody else. 
to create those for you. So you might say, I need this kind of uh, data. So we are going to have ways of gathering that data and offering that data for, for this person. I don't know if you want to. At this stage of, of, the, of the beta launch, we're not really having these premium services. They're going on the roadmap. But we're going to have mashups of data so you can mix up data you want and have the results. You have new data, new kinds of data. You'll be able, like Diego said, like ask for data to be created for you. And what we solve and what we're trying to really get to the consumer is the time he spends searching on Google either or Bing and just finding the data you need and doing it whatever you want to. So it definitely seems like a good idea. Um, one thought that I had is uh, when I was doing a lot of sales, and I'm only talking from a tech perspective, a lot of premium data sort of resides with corporations like International Data Corporation, IDC, which is a global organization, <coughs> research organization. And it seems to be, again, just in the tech world, that's where a lot of the information comes from, from the Mary Meeker reports and things like that. So I guess as an idea and as maybe as potential revenue stream, have you thought about partnering with some of the IDCs of the world and then extracting some of that super rich premium data for others to use? Actually, that's a great point. We mentioned uh, one uh, way of getting revenues to the company, but that is actually something that we really, we really like. There's a lot of companies, uh, there's a lot of public data. You might have heard about Factual, about Google doing very interesting things with data sets. So there's a lot of data out there. There's a lot of companies that are charging big amounts of money, setting big reports to, I mean, corpor corporations or people that can pay high amounts. But we think that there's a very interesting opportunity for getting to the long tail, some of the data that is contained in these huge reports. If you're an entrepreneur or you want a piece of data, you don't want to pay for a big report. So basically what we are being able to do if we partner with these kind of companies is allow them to cater their, their information to another sector, right? Are you guys going to have any expertise in the visualization part? Uh, you could see this really becoming consumer friendly if you know, you throw up a, the, Egypt, the Egypt stats on your plasma or the Iraq war stats on your plasma constantly ticking down. Is there going to be work by you guys or by your community on making really cool visualization? Actually, so the data value chain is, is big, right? Uh, visualization is a very important piece of this value chain. And we're not, we don't think that that's going to be our core competency. There are, very interesting companies doing very cool things with data visualization. Actually, Google is doing something very interesting. So we expect more to bring, be, be very good at bringing all this data and allowing users to find this data and share the, this data if they need to, uh, and partner with companies that are doing already great things in visualization. Of course, we need to be able to offer the users the possibility of centralizing and making it easier for them to check out all these data streams but then all the graphic part and everything, we might be able to partner with some other people. Great. I had one question. Um, you showed a lot of data, and I think Mark Pesci has one too. Uh, you showed a lot of data there, but you didn't show any interaction between the disparate data sets. Um, and so that's my first question. Can I take statistics from, I don't know, the UN and then mash them up and then republish that with data from, I don't know, the US Census or something? Uh, and then second, how do you deal with copyright you didn't really adequately address that um, because I, I know it's a tool, but I mean, data is you know, typically very protected fiercely. And yep. No, so both good questions. Uh, so the first part is we, whenever someone is creating one of these data streams, they're adding a lot of tags. And those, via all the semantic stuff we're doing, allows us to connect a lot of these data streams. So if you go and look for one data stream, there are some tags that relate this data stream to another or to a dashboard. So by clicking on one tag, you may be routed to other pieces of data that this community has created, right? So we are connecting a lot of these data streams. And the second part, which since the beginning, a lot of our investors told us you should go and check for what's going on there. Uh, if we are, I mean, we're mapping a lot of the data that exists already in the web, number one. So for that data, we're just linking and we're always offering the source, right? So in that sense, we're covered. And the second part is for the data that we're going to get from our partners, then we're, we're going to, of course, be paying the right for that data, so that's going to be covered as well.
you had a question? It seems like you're really setting yourself up almost as the Wikipedia of data, that you have a crowdsource model. So that means that you're going to have millions of contributors. So I guess my first question is, will you be able to scale for that? And will I, as a contributor, really want to contribute data unless I know that it's being delivered up in a Creative Commons context, in other words, that it's freely shared? Uh, of course, we need to get all the good incentives for people to become uh, contributors, right? And we have a lot of those in our roadmap. It's part of uh, actually what we think is going to make us uh, get to the market and be able to get a lot of these contributors. Of course, we know that uh, only one or two percent of the whole community is going to be contributing to this. And we've already defined which are the incentives that we'll need to give to these people so that they can be really interested in contributing. Awesome. Let's hear it for Junar. Thank you. Okay, moving at a nice pace. Let's bring out New Air. New Air. New Air. New Air. Ah, New Air. Hello. Thanks, Don. All right, so we're seeing some great products today. And all these products came about because of a story. And my story goes back to the Web 1.0 era. And that was with the QCAT. Now, how many of you guys picked up a QCAT at a Radio Shack store, yeah, that's right, or got one mailed to you by Wired or maybe Forbes magazine. So this little gadget right here, I invented in 97, 98 with some guys in Dallas, Texas, and we had a dream of connecting the physical world, print products with the virtual world. So this ended up being the most hacked device ever, and still to this day, people are hacking it. Anybody take one apart, get rid of my encryption? Yeah, it's a really common thing to do. So the inspiration for this product led us to develop what I'm going to show you today, which is ToothTag. We started thinking about all the radios that were inside cell phones. These things do 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, GPS, and even Bluetooth and near-field communications, which we're going to see a lot more of. So ToothTag lets you scan a room of all the wireless devices. And watch out, because I'm scanning you guys right now. And I can tag certain devices. I can tag Wi-Fi hotspots in the room. I can tag cell phones. And I can set up rules based upon things that I tag. So first thing I did was really simple. I tagged a phone. So I tagged my little BlackBerry here. The user scenario here would be I'd be sitting inside of a coffee shop, and a friend would walk by outside on the street. And my tooth tag enabled phone would start ringing, playing a sound, even vibrating when my friends walk by outside. So no longer do you have to do a heads in, check in, look behavior. Your phone just starts vibrating or starts doing an event automatically. Another good application is to uh, vibrate your ex-girlfriends too, so you know when to leave the bar. <laughs> now, Bluetooth handsets, you guys have, uh, everybody knows the little uh, jaw bones, you name it. You probably have them, dozens of them sitting into a drawer. So you can also tag headsets and put those in your kid's pocket or your kid's backpacks. And you can have disconnect alerts. So it's not just connections when people get too close. My favorite disconnect event is tagging my car. So when I turn it off, it drops a pin on Google Maps. And just by adding it to a map, I can see where I parked and very easily navigate myself back. Oh, thank you, thank you. So there's an example. You just pop it up, and we're going to do the little breadcrumbs to take you right back to your car. So yeah, the San Franciscoites love that feature. I want that for my so <laughs> these are events that are uh, residing within the phone. So in our true hacker spirit, we thought, what if we do some events that are API driven? So yesterday when I walked in here, I tagged the Wi-Fi access points with uh, launch and checked them into Foursquare. So that element uh, links to your existing Foursquare account. You can say on connect, hold down, and in a second it's going to pull up all the API venues of Foursquare. So you can scroll through all these. At the oh. top we put launch, just select that. And you can set a threshold. So if you go into your coffee shop 10 times a day and you don't want your boss to know about it, you can say, only check me in if I've been there for 10 minutes. Oh. Click OK. You can even do a shout message. And then when I walked into this venue this morning, it automatically checked me in. So that's kind of cool. So thank you. So uh, last but not least, how many here use Google Voice? Yeah, very popular service. Google Voice is awesome, but I don't quite trust the Borg to take all of my calls. So I just do the call blast, right? So when you call my G Voice number, it rings my cell phone, it rings my office phone, and it rings my Google chat account. So I can set, or I'm sorry, the problem with that 
is when my cell phone is off, it takes over my voicemail for Google Voice. So meaning my cell phone rings directly into, or my, my voicemail to Google Voice rings directly into my cell phone voicemail and I don't get the call. So since I have bad cell coverage at my house, when my Android phone sees my laptop open up, it starts forwarding to my Gmail account, so then I can take the call on my laptop. When I get to my office, it starts forwarding the calls from Google Voice to my desk phone, and that's through seeing the Wi-Fi. So you can set up all these connect and disconnect rules and point them at any service uh, that we have enabled here. So that's um, kind of the, the icing on the cake, though. And in the spirit of Steve Jobs' birthday, you all know it's his birthday today, right? Yeah. So I want to do one more thing. Should I do the one more thing or is that a little bit gauche? And one more thing. <laughs> All right, one more thing it is. Okay, so the one more thing is you guys. We've built this as a platform. And the platform is such that you can build these applications on top of it. And we kind of have a vision for this platform. The vision is that you walk into a room and you never meet a stranger. You're able to maybe see via tie-ins with LinkedIn or tie-ins with uh, Foursquare that someone is nearby that you should meet. And at the top, we've got Charlie Sheen. He just got out of rehab. I should definitely go grab a drink with him. Don Dodge is nearby. I can click on Don's LinkedIn profile and find out that yes, indeed, he's still at Google and uh, we should chat with him. And then people that I should meet as well. I see Jessica Jones has a 42% match with me based upon match.com. Now that's higher of a percentage of match than any girl I've dated in real life. So I definitely have to talk to her. And then at the end, you'll see some offers, bin 38, buy one, get one free. Maybe we can have a little angel gate session there. And then a Groupon offer for cleaning. So this is the vision that we have for the platform. So thank you. Wow. Um, if you guys only knew what a mess this presentation was 48 hours ago, holy cow, that was awesome. Uh, feedback from our judges. Putting the smart in smartphone. Thank you. Wow, yeah, good tagline. I like it. Is the, is the Wi-Fi just SSID, or do you? So all of these, all radios beacon a MAC address. Okay. So uh, unlike Google, we don't look into the packets. We just look at the, the header information. <laughs> hey, so, you guys all love this. Is great. I love it. But <laughs> that's a really geeky low blow. But you won't get. You won't get. Yeah. yeah. So it's that was but, a but, but no, good point. So we look you at. Won't get false positive with. No, no, you have to actually see the device. Yeah. yeah, you have to see the device. Um, we also do calls on uh, the Foursquare API or any other APIs to get any geo data as well. And with near field communication, that was the big buzz at Mobile World Congress last week. Right. And the Nexus S is the first phone to have that. I think we'll see more phones. Maybe the iPhone has that in the future. So this NFC is just an evolution. And we'll just do this as building blocks on, on top of the new air platform. But at least initially, you need to keep your Wi-Fi on. Sort of. So we can also go through APIs. So if your friends are checking in through legacy systems, we can get information data through API calls on the two-way services as well. But it works best with wireless because it's in your pocket, heads down. So great presentation. I totally want to use it. It seems really clean, elegant, seamless, awesome. But how much of a lead time do you think you have vis-a-vis -vis your competitors? And the corollary question is, is there any IP around this? Yeah. So with a QCAT, I have uh, 110 patents. Uh, personally, I have 65 granted. So uh, I spend a lot of time with intellectual property. It's how I go to sleep at night. It's really boring. But the, um, yeah, we've got such a far lead time in this. There have been auto check-in services, and those have used GPS. And as you know, GPS will just destroy a battery. So if you keep that on throughout the day, you'll get, what, your battery life goes from uh, uh, the morning to the afternoon, you're already dead. So we use lower power technologies. I think we've got a huge head start. Interesting to see what people do in the gaming space with this too. Yeah, absolutely. That could be fun. Yeah, it's like a real but, world scripting language. Yeah, to, to the IP question, I mean, you really are just monitoring network traffic, looking at MAC addresses, associating them, and adding your own services. But that's a code snippet that'll get out there. Like, that's just, that's not a complex idea. So what's the next step? Where, how do you get people to pay for this and lock them in? Do you yep. launch a SDK right. for iOS now and get people using your stuff? Or Yeah, that's a great question. It's, just, it's the technique that's interesting, but other people are going to go cool and go figure it yep. out. Yep. So I partnered with Rob Meadows with Originate Labs. He's got a great development shop that's done mobile backend database uh, applications for dozens of other companies. And the whole idea is to release an API that anyone can tap into. And that means anyone is all you guys, by the way. Are you guys going to build an app? A killer so, app that will be an example? 
So that's what Tooth Tag is. Actually, Tooth Tag is available in the Android store right now. You can uh, download it today in the spirit of launch. And the, the Tooth Tag app is really a showcase app to the platform. I don't really want to be in the app business. I want to be in the enabling business. So are you recreating Skyhook, like a user-generated Skyhook? Yeah, sort of, kind of, not really. But um, interesting analogy. I think this is super rad. Um, <laughs> that's a great answer. I think this is super rad, despite the sport coats, which threw me off at first. Um, <laughs> thought maybe you guys were going to pitch a banking platform or something. Um, Thanks, I, uh, yeah, I think this is great. I think we've seen technologies like this that make things that hackers are capable of doing like more accessible to the public, right? I mean, Blogger was really just a front end on FTP, and yet suddenly tens to hundreds of millions of people could publish. And I think what you're doing is, as you said, it's a real world scripting language, and yet most people can't script. And so this kind of generates a whole new accessibility to creative applications for this, and it's pretty cool. Um, I was thinking specifically about your example of your phone letting you find your car. Yeah. And I was thinking it would actually be really useful for me if my car could help me find my phone. <laughs> so maybe enable it in the other direction yeah. too. So um, how many people carry uh, multiple smartphones, multiple phones? You guys, like I've got an Android in one pocket, a Bluetooth in another, and a Blackberry, I'm sorry, uh, iPhone, Android, whatever, everything. So when my phones lose each other, they kind of alert me and show me yeah, the map and on the map. So that's cool. Yeah, I feel like one your killer app is just, <laughs> dude, where's my car? Yeah, but you know, that's <laughs> such a small piece. And there's other apps already in the Android store that do that. Yeah. I just think it's a good example. Yeah, I guess. it's good. I, well, I like that. I mean, the, <laughs> the good news is check. it's in there. It's like Prego. And we can <laughs> add all this other cool stuff on top of it. I, um, I, I just like something to happen when I walk away from my PC, things like that. I see so many yeah. things being enabled by this technology. Right. Yeah. yeah, and there's esoteric stuff I didn't do, like auto login. So when you walk up to your computer, it logs you in. You could set this up to auto let you in your door if you have a door buzzer. I mean, you could get so as geeky yeah. as you want. It would be awesome. It's kind of a crazy idea, but could you have like a little uh, something that you put on your keychain that also talks to your your cell sure. phone? So if yeah. you lose your keys, it's funny. We thought <laughs> it about that. All the you, time. Yeah, you could you could hook your old Bluetooth earpiece on. We thought about that, but fundamentally we're changing human behavior. And one of the things I got dinged with most with the QCAT, which goes back to '97, before Wi-Fi, before smartphones, no camera phones or anything, is people said I was changing human behavior. So for you to have to charge your keys or charge a dongle on your cell phone. I think those are uh, disruptive in their own. And um, probably won't get as much traction that way. But the good news is being open, being a platform, anybody can do whatever their killer app is for it. So we can definitely drill a hole in a Bluetooth earpiece for you and put it on your keychain. <laughs> awesome. Uh, let's hear it for Jason. Now, the company's Thank you. New Air, Jason. right? The company is New Air. Yes. And the product you showed is? It's Tooth Tag. Tooth Tag. Okay. Yep. And new, new Air, you see I had to get really creative with spelling it when, um, you know, yeah. no longer can you drop an E or an add two it's E's like we did with yes. Boxy. You've got to do all vowels. <laughs> awesome. Dave, Thank you. Dave. Wait. Hold on. Oh, Not going to let you off the hook. Hey, what's up, Brian? Pass this down? Right, well, oh, yeah. uh, two real quick things. Sorry. Uh, I know you already got the, your final applause. Um, one, iPhone. How are you going to do it on an iPhone? Obviously, premium platform. Uh, they're kind of leading the way for smartphones that don't do backgrounding anything. That's right. And this relies on backgrounding. So yep. that's obviously a really important component. And then second, um, you didn't mention business model at all. Do you need a business model anymore? Yes. It's like, it's like 2011, isn't it? We had no business models last year. Um, no, I think the business model is very much like MySQL. So MySQL has a free version. Uh, when people it's start getting menu. traction, then we'll start uh, having charging for it. Um, and Rob's company did a product called TechTrack on the iPhone very much like find my iPhone on mobile me, and we actually got uh, multitasking to work. So we're gonna use some of the intellectual property from one of his other projects and make the thing come back to life. <laughs> He's saying no. We're going to recreate the intellectual property. Oh, right, sorry. I used the wrong term. We're going to use an idea of the technology, but not the find my iPhone element, so. Right. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Well done. I just want to mention for the people who are in the VIP section, yes, there is Starbucks and red wine available. However, it does smell like somebody smoking weed here. That is not on the menu. Just want to be clear that that's not our weed. And whoever has it, uh, seat A12 is uh, my seat. Okay, uh, let's do our... I'm not looking at you, Chris. I'm not looking at you. No? 
<laughs> Dude, that was an awesome presentation. Uh, let's welcome Open Space up for another groovy presentation. Open Space, get out here and stop smoking that weed backstage. Come on, man. It really does smell like weed. Like a lot. Like, that's like somebody's got a bong in, in, in I'm a little confused. Wait, just as I walked out, you said what? No, just it's just, it's, it's reeking of weed in the front section. It's awesome. Okay, let's keep going. It makes it easier to present. Hi, everyone. Hey! It's, if HTML5 is going to survive as a platform and compete with proprietary devices, it's going to need an app store, one that's easy and has massive scale. We're open space, and I'd like to walk you through how we're going to do that. Randy? Launching is the first thing that's critical. Once you purchase something, it has to be easy and fast. Or not. <laughs> What Randy just did is he launched the HTML5 version of the New York Times. What I'd like to do is show you exactly how he was able to put that in his launcher. Randy, would you mind navigating to the HTML Times, excuse me, the New York Times? On the right-hand side of the page, there's a little widget over there that says open. Please do that. Hovering over the individual items displays a summary. Clicking gives you detail information photos, as well as reviews. And if you want to purchase something, it's as simple as clicking. It's now installed and ready to go. What's interesting about the way we've decided to solve discovery is the application actually comes with you rather than you having to go to it. So let's navigate to another web page. How many people have children? This is a great math games website. And let's do the same thing, Randy. Let's purchase the PBS version because we know we trust them. And that's it. If we're ready to now go, we can launch those applications we just purchased. And it's that easy. So that's the first part of this, is how easy can we make it? As simple as a click and making it easy to discover the applications that you want to purchase. It's all done in a personalized manner and it isolates based on where you are. Randy's going to launch into the PBS game. Thanks PBS for doing that as part of the demo. And let me talk a little bit about distribution because that's the second part of this. What we've done is we've created a developer's cooperative. We want to bring the power back to the people. Not put it in the device manufacturers, but actually give it to the developers and the content creators. Thank you. Yes. In doing that, what we've set up is a referral program as well as we're putting all of the rules, ter terms of service up onto the website and allowing them to vote. This way, they understand ahead of time what the rules are and they can actually influence them. The referral program will pay them 5% for any user that they recommend use the open space product. I'm Robert Rich. This is Randy Wattler, and we're open space. Wow. OpenSpaceStore.com. Okay. Any questions? Judges. Do you guys understand it? No. no. I, I see some... where, where do the apps come from? How are they, how are they discovered <laughs> on those pages? How are they discovered on the pages? And where do they, who made those apps? Where did they come from? How so are the they... developers themselves upload the apps to the app store? And register them to content? Or you do, you um, do content analysis on New York Times to match it to apps? Or you do... Yes, that's exactly right. There's two things that are actually happening there. The first one is we understand where they are. The second one is there's a personalization engine. So you will get different recommendations than I will based on my behavior and my patterns. And what's interesting, the way we solve the problem is all of that is stored locally rather than being pushed back to the server. So you're not actually sharing information as part of that process. Okay. The judges are confused. They don't understand it. <laughs> what question? So it's, I mean, at the high level, it's an app store. We're focused on HTML5 apps. In the way of discovery, we've moved it away. Instead of going to an app store, the app store actually comes to you. And then it, discover, it discovers things that are relevant and interesting based on what you're currently doing. And then you just click and install. So talk about customer acquisition. So I think that's maybe where we're getting stuck is at some point people have to know to go to open space and give you payment information and figure out how to use it. So just talk through your strategy on that. So when the way we're going to get 
consumers to interact with this is through the cooperative. And what we're doing is we're partnering with applications that already exist out there, and they're going to co-install the open space application along with theirs. We're in talks, and we haven't closed it all up yet, but it looks like we'll be somewhere between 50 to 100 million people when we actually close those out. So it'll be a large app store with massive distribution. Okay. <laughs> I guess I've stumped everybody. Well, I'll, I'll throw a question out there. Maybe I'm still trying to understand it, but sure. is there a review process that needs to happen? So, you know, it, I guess a two-part question. One, is there a review process? Because a lot of the complaints that we've heard from iPhone developers is that their app never really makes it on the iPhone App Store. Yep. Um, and then the corollary question to that is um, both the App Store as well as the Android space, it's getting incredibly crowded, so it's hard to find apps. So is that is that something that is going to have to that you're going to have to think about? Yeah, open so space? Okay. as it relates to reviewing, we do that internally. We're, we're building up our staff in the way of reviewing the individual apps as they get submitted by the developers. And then discovery, and I think what you're asking is are we doing more discovery other than just HTML5? Can you purchase Android apps or other types? Yes, you can. Um, the demo you saw, and we moved through it really quickly, shows browser extensions or browser add-ons as well as HTML5. Um, what I didn't mention also is when you purchase something, we'll also sync it to all of your different devices. So if I have an Android device, there's an open space application that's available for that. I purchased the New York Times app in one location, it actually shows up over here for me as well. So we've kind of taken care of all the management around actually purchasing, and we're device independent. Yeah, I, I think the big problem here is I, I think we've all decided as an industry that Flash is going to win, right? <laughs> um, no, seriously, um, you know, I can go to Chrome today. They've got an app store. It works for me. Um, WebOS is the other, I think, big HTML5, CSS, JavaScript play. They're going to have an app store. So I think you're in, in third place at this point. Uh, at some point, Apple does the same. Uh, I mean, effectively, the app store that they have on Mac OS X is yeah. an HTML5 app store. So you're in fourth place. Um, I'm just worried that open space really translates to empty space. Um, but Ooh. Ouch. I think we know who the sound is. If they get the leftmost spot uh, on my, my Apple taskbar, they move the Apple store one to the right, they might win. That's where I'm looking. So, so the answer to that is if you're locked into a single platform, it works really well. The iPhone does a great job if you've got an iPhone and a Mac. But if you want to use a PC and, a, and an iPhone, it starts to cause problems. And a lot of people have PCs at the work. They have Android devices or iPhone devices. They have Macs at home. You want a platform or a purchasing platform that crosses all of those. And Apple doesn't have a reason to really make that happen. Google doesn't have a reason to really make that happen. So you need an independent play Chrome to do that. On, I can get Chrome on all those platforms. So I, I, just, I'm, I don't know what the need that's being serviced here is. I think the unique piece is the open piece. Right. That yeah. there's no company except for you guys that is controlling everything. Let's take a question from the grand jury. Marshall Kirkpatrick from Read Right Web. So I, am I understanding correctly that this is, yeah, that this is a competitor to the Chrome Web App Store, but it seems to me that the value proposition is around the, the contextual recommendations and the behavioral recommendations. And then you're saying that it, you, the apps that you purchase then, instead of living in a new tab, as they do on Chrome, live in this sidebar uh, pull drawer, and then they can go, you can take them with you across multiple platforms, web, mobile, and, and others. Yes, it's exactly what it does. Okay. Uh, so, okay. One Dave, question. Ahead, yep. So, um, one of the reasons I think that people like the App Store is because it's a store, and you can browse it and look for things. So, do you guys have a storefront of some kind, or is it all this distributed widget that sits on top of? Um, we do have a website. We'll be rolling it out, but we're launching with the widget to the start. Widget. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Let's uh, thank Open Space. Okay, uh, so judges, for session three we had audio micro in the 2.0 category, then we had Graphite, um, the contact relationship management uh, platform, Junar, the sort of database, uh, Wikipedia of databases, New Air, um, wireless notification platform, and open space and open app store that's cross-platform. 
uh, which one did you like most and which one was your second favorite? Which one would you most like to own shares in or uh, work for? Which one would you most like to use? Um, Andrea, what did, what did you like? Sure. Uh, New Air definitely stuck out as a winner for me. And then even though I gave the guys a hard time from Graphite, if they can come up with a solution that really is killer as an ex-salesperson, I would use it in an instant. Great. So uh, New Air, very interesting, uh, and Graphite, if they could make an addicting product. Yeah. David, which two are I, your favorites? I agree with Andrea. I, I really like New Air. It's a problem that I need to solve for myself. Personally, I think a lot of people have the same problem. They don't have a business model. Um, and then even though I was skeptical about Graphite, I think you know, if they can um, work that out, it could be a very useful tool. Awesome. Aaron, did you have a favorite? Semi-similar. New Air is an interesting idea. Not sure it's a business or a company yet. I think a lot of people are going to go, that's awesome, and how do I do it? And I'm worried about that for them. And Graphite is cool, but I want to see both sides of the algorithm. Right. Both the piece that is who should I contact, but also who I am contacting constantly. So I know, because if they have the ranking, they can show me both. I'm actually interested in both extremes. Not so just, the people who you have good relationships with, yeah, who how do I good are they? In the path? People yeah. who you should be deepening relationships right. with. Uh, I, yes. Both sides of that are really interesting, and they're only dealing with half. They could do both. It would be cool. Yeah. So New Air and then Graphite are your two? Yes. Jeff, what did you like? You know, I think uh, Graphite, I think, was the one that was solving the clearest need. I think that's something that I, I personally deal with a lot is, you know, forgetting to follow up with people. So that's one I'd want to use. Uh, and then on the, the business side, I just think Audio Micro, because they had the scalability to go to so many different verticals, and I think they've identified at least one or two that are going to be big. Yes. I think and, that, I think from a business standpoint, that's better. The one yeah. question I had on, on, on Graphite, just to go back to it for a second, it wasn't clear to me if they were selling to, a, to the enterprise or to the individual. Yeah, yeah I think I, they're pretty clearly going to me. individuals. Yeah, but, but just, from what I know of it. Your questions it were wasn't enterprise clear. questions, but I actually don't think it's going to work. I think it's going to be consumer app for Graphite. Yeah. That's yeah. going to be cool. For Graphite? For gra yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah Ted, I don't think the enterprise thing is Is there happen. one you would most want to take a follow-up meeting with as an investor? Uh, you know, I think if they can get a really passionate community, Junar could be a very cool company. A, a community that's out there scouring for CDC information or new, new uh, liquor permits being filed in San Francisco and they can visualize that and, and push it out. I think they could have a very interesting business, but there's going to need to be a pretty hefty human layer in between the data and the actual sales so so that one fascinated cool. you the most did you have a second place anybody you thought you yeah know? i like i like new air i mean i it seems like someone can make a long battery length bluetooth uh, device that you could stick on your bike stick on your backpack and get alerted anytime it moves within or moves out of range so that 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 seems like it'd be very interesting chris any Blue of these uh, interesting to you as an investor or, uh, or as a user uh, yeah, so New Air is really interesting to me as a guy with a background in wireless and, and automation. Uh, and I think, and I'm not worried about competitive threats there right now. I do think there aren't many people working on this hard enough yet. Right. Um, and, uh, and I'm not worried about their model. I think they could very easily be acquired or just build kind of forced automation and some of those tax forcing offers. I mean, if you, um, I think we're seeing the cost per location ad model evolve right now, the door swing. Uh, it's something that hasn't really been possible on a passive basis. It's only ever happened on an active basis, checking in somewhere. But if you could ever show the relatedness between people who've seen tweets about X who show up near dealerships for X, like, that's bankable. And you would so, close the loop. So yeah, speak. absolutely. It's a really tight feedback loop that makes a lot of money. So I'm excited about that. And then the marketplace guys, um, audio, micro, um, I, I I love the fact that they've built a platform that could be skinned. And I think sometimes um, you don't overthink it. You just throw it out there and you let a bunch of different stores happen and you, these niche communities come up. I mean, uh, I remember when I heard Scott from Meetup say a long time ago that one of the populations they had never anticipated being popular on Meetup was ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. Like, without the church there, they couldn't find each other anymore. Meetup happens, they can find each other, and, like, mm. he never designed a business for ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, but they ended up being rabid users of this thing. Yes. And so I think when you, when you throw a platform up there and let anyone skin it, they can go crazy. I worry about the tattoo stuff a little bit because I think they'll bump into Deviant Art, which has just, um, which, which is just a fascinatingly big business in terms of content and art licensing, and I have a feeling they're going to run into each other, but, but I'm still pretty bullish on that. 
Dave, what are your thoughts? Uh, same to, uh, I really like New Air. Like I said, I think it's a real world scripting language. Um, you know, I think that it could, I think one of the things they should focus on is just making killer apps that really describe how this can work for a real consumer. I think that's going to be the hardest part of selling the technology. Um, and uh, the marketplace, Audio Micro, I really like that. I think that um, they uh, have clearly uh, found a few markets that are illiquid and they're sort of starting to see some growth. But um, I think I would sort of figure out which verticals are moving fastest and double down on those pretty quickly and focus. Cool. Um, you can vote at simx dot uh, com, and so download the app and vote. We're going to take a 10 minute break and then we're going to have six companies that our grand jury selected from the launch pad. These are some of the most promising, odd, interesting uh, folks who didn't make it on stage because they probably were launched a little bit already. Um, and they're going to have three minutes to present. So it's going to be very rapid fire right after a 10 minute break. Let's thank our judges for an excellent job.